The fall of Civic Center Park didn't happen overnight. We have internal emails showing how Denver lost control and how it plans to take it back. The parks director telling police months ago they were overrun. Talk permanent fencing before Civic Center reopens as leaders at the state capitol and art museum try to figure out how to keep a migration from coming to their lawns. In news that should not be news to anyone, Colorado schools with mask rules have fewer COVID cases. A softball player who refused to be told she couldn't play the game she loves. And you are putting together hundreds of at-home libraries for students in low-income neighborhoods because it sure beats sitting there watching the news. And because this is next. Civic Center Park, Denver's downtown landmark, spiraled out of control for months before it was closed to the public. Tonight, we have internal city emails showing that police were warned months ago that park staff were overrun by crime. Civic Center's popular food truck events were ended early due to crime. And behind the scenes, the city and downtown power players were trying to figure out how to contain the park's problems from spilling into nearby streets when it was closed. Here's Marshall Zellinger. This is as close as you'll get inside Civic Center Park for now. It's closed as part of a public health order. Between Pioneer, McIntosh Plaza, and this park, we were finding hundreds of needles every day. Temporary fencing is around the park, and based on emails obtained by Nine Wants to Know, emails revealing discussions ahead of the park's closure, there's a reference to a permanent wrought iron fence. We're not spending anything right at this point for a wrought iron fence. Deputy Parks Director Scott Gilmore told me the park is not going to have a mansion-like fence put around it. We have not really discussed fencing this whole park, but we have discussed possibly trying to put some wrought iron fencing in strategic locations around the historic structures. There's another email from the Parks Department asking for security for the contractor repositioning the security cameras in the park. The city was concerned for their safety. At the table just next to me, I saw somebody, you know, come over and inject something into their arm. Ten years of producing Civic Center East, being down there 60 plus days a year, I had never seen that sort of interaction. Eric Lazari um, of the so Civic Center Conservancy runs Civic Center Eats, the lunchtime food truck event during the summertime. In an August email, he wrote, We will be ending Eats on September 2nd this year for a variety of reasons, but the fact that Civic Center is not safe is high among them. Um, you know, we can certainly get into conversations about safe being a word that means a lot of different things to a lot of people, but I think most people who came to Civic Center this summer felt uncomfortable in some way, shape, or form. Then there's the email from the Denver Art Museum just before the park's closure was announced. The museum was uncomfortable about what it called the migration that would follow a park closure. People moving over to the museum area just as national media come to town for a big event in October. The museum told us today it was simply concerned for the health and safety of staff and guests. These internal emails to and from city officials show there was longtime concern about crime and health hazards in the park and worry that closing the park will just send those problems elsewhere. So there was planning for that. So these, these emails show that before the park was closed, the nonprofits that will bring food for folks who are homeless there in the mm -hmm. park, that there was a deal made between the city and the state that the state would not allow those nonprofits to feed people right across the street. There's an email from a person who runs the Capitol Complex at the state that runs a Lincoln Veterans Memorial Park between Lincoln and Broadway, and that email talks about how they wouldn't permit charitable food functions, meaning you wouldn't give a permit to people who want to give food to the homeless in that mm -hmm. area. I found out only one uh, permit was recommended or asked for, but then they turned it down because they didn't want to pay the permit fee. So it didn't do anything really. So these internal emails also show that the, the organizers of the Nine News Parade of Lights were strongly encouraged by the city to either cancel this year's parade or move it somewhere else. That was a surprising email to see. And I spoke with Sharon Alton, who runs the parade for the Downtown Denver Partnership. And she told me that nothing is changing, at least having the parade. They permit the park to keep it closed for other purposes. They need that space for the park, mm -hmm. but they don't use the park. They use Bannock and they use Downtown streets. The only thing that is changing is no grandstands this year, but that's not because of safety at the park. That's because of COVID uh, reasons. Gotcha. We had a different parade last year uh, for COVID issues as well. Marshall, thank you. Almost 60% of Coloradans have completed the vaccination process, and today CDC advised that older Coloradans and people with underlying health issues 
should get a booster shot. Extra dose would be six months after the original shots for people who are 65 plus, people in long-term care, and anybody 18 years or older with health issues. So we're talking about some still undefined sliver of the 3.4 million Coloradans who are fully vaxxed right now. And then you got another 315,000 Coloradans waiting on second doses. All right, now brace yourself for an onslaught of the obvious. Colorado's public health experts unveiled stats today showing that schools without mask requirements have higher COVID rates. So the shaded period of time shows you when we would expect to start seeing the impact of, of a mask um, requirement in those schools. And so you see that starting in late August, we see those lines diverge and you see that the lower case rates are associated with districts that are requiring masks in schools. Um, again, showing um, a clear impact that masks are having in decreasing transmission in our school settings. So we, we know that even if younger people aren't likely to get super sick with COVID, uh, protecting younger people, vaccinating those who are old enough to get vaccinated, protects the more vulnerable in our community, prevents widespread uh, spread of the virus. So it's concerning to see the disparity among which teenagers in Denver are getting the vaccine. Our new Roy explains how this is not a new issue or one that's just about the COVID vaccine. The city of Denver shows the highest number of 12 to 17 year olds who've received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine are white teens. That number cuts in half for Hispanic and Latino teens and then dips to around 40% for black and Asian Pacific Islander teens. This is also part of the age group doctors have been worried about. We have seen an uptick in COVID patients, but uh, fortunately most of them do not need hospitalization. Uh, and I think that's because of their immune system as well as their resilience to some of the COVID variants. But we've also seen the other side of that spectrum. We've seen very sick kids, and unfortunately, we've seen a few pass away from COVID. And while we're talking COVID now, Dr. Washington with Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children said he's seen these kind of stats before. It's actually uh, mimics what we see in normal vaccinations, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, and those types of vaccinations. There's a disparity there as well. The issues are the same, no matter which sickness you're talking about. Not understanding the scientific process, bad information, a lack of diversity among healthcare workers. If you don't have a, a medical home where you feel safe, uh, you feel like they trust you, you feel like they're in tune with your uh, individual needs, you're not likely to access the healthcare system unless you're really sick. The community that we're serving purposely the majority don't have access to health insurance. They don't have a regular doctor. But Maria Gonzalez, the founder of Adelante Community Development, said once you reach the teens, needles and COVID, the story starts to change. What I'm seeing at the flea market, uh, a lot of the younger generations that are getting the vaccine, they're actually happy and encouraging. They're, some of them are actually convincing their fathers to come and get vaccinated themselves. <laughs> So that one organization has been able to vaccinate 10,000 people since February just by meeting people where they were going to spend their day anyway, and they're going to keep doing that for the next couple of weeks. I do, Kyle, always like to give a little perspective on these numbers. The city says they know that some of the numbers are a little bit wonky because they're using multiple sets of data, but they also said while it's not perfect, they do feel really confident that it's giving them the big picture of what's happening with vaccine rates. Mm -hmm. But the disparities exist for sure, and there are people out they're working hard yep. to break through 100%. one by one. Thank you, Anusha. I love your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week uh, because we're buying books for students in low-income communities around the Denver metro area, and not just any books. These are books with lead characters of color that reflect the students who are in Scholars Unlimited's after-school programs. So you probably know that nonprofit. They've been serving Colorado for decades, and their latest idea was to make the most out of your weekly Word of Thanks generosity to buy books for their students to keep at home, the start of a personal library. And since last night, you've raised more than $25,000. That is five books for each of the about 500 students in the program. Text THANKS to 303-871-1491 to join me and a whole bunch of next viewers in giving some books to these kids. We give each of these students an even larger stack of stories of heroes and heroines that will reflect their families and their communities and will fuel their imagination. She conquered all the challenges of growing up with the one arm she was born with, from tying her shoes to finding a sport, cheerleading, but she really wanted to play softball. Determination that inspired others to help. That somebody's willing to put forth the effort. 
love to watch somebody succeed. And it's a sign that we probably shouldn't even be showing you. Next. The final draft of Colorado's new congressional map suggests that the soon to be 8th district in our state would be a real toss up and that Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert would be safe in her seat. Biggest change in this latest map is that it makes Democratic Congressman Ed Perlmutter's 7th district a bit more competitive. Currently, he has Jefferson and Adams counties. New map would make it Jeffco plus counties to the south. The soon to be created 8th district, that's in purple there, middle top of the map, would be parts of Adams and Weld County, specifically carved to maximize Latino and Hispanic representation. Based on recent elections, the 8th would be a swing district under that map. The Independent Commission putting together the map has till Tuesday to agree on one of the versions. If they don't, it'll be that latest one that goes to the state Supreme Court for approval. Faith Christian Academy in Arvada has to follow Jefferson County's mask mandate and give health inspectors access to classrooms whenever they want. A judge decided that about a half an hour ago. Jefferson County Public Health sued the school along with two other schools for refusing to follow their mask mandate. The health department reached an agreement with Eden and Augustine Classical Academy yesterday, dropped the suit against them. Faith Christian would not give in, saying that they were following the county's guidance while arguing that the order was unconstitutional. Judge disagreed with Faith Christian, so time to mask up. little smoke and haze to kick off our Thursday morning Christmas. See us capturing the sunrise still look pretty, but tonight as a cold front pushes through, it will help to push out some of the smoke, some of the haze and also help to cool us off. A couple of scattered showers going up across the high country tonight. 30s and 40s for overnight lows, 40s here in eastern Colorado. We'll be watching those showers wind down, but we'll kick off the day with a few clouds tomorrow here in the metro. They shouldn't last long. The sunshine returns by the later afternoon. Again, that cold front, it's going to be a fast mover. It brings us one day with cooler temperatures and then the heat's on. Enjoy the 70s while you can because the 80s are back and possibly near record heat on Sunday. The game she loves wasn't made for her. She refused to give it up. You never expect to go out into the field and be like, oh, your best player is the girl with one arm. For the love of the game, it's a story of adaptation and determination. Next. We all have our own barriers to success, you know, some of them bigger than others. Arcady Eastman and photojournalist Ann Herps met a teenager in Fort Collins who really wanted to succeed at playing softball, despite a pretty significant barrier. What if I burp? <laughs> when the what ifs pile up. I realize I am gonna grunt. The worst <laughs> is easy to imagine. I gotta quit making that sound. And sometimes those worries come true. Oh no, I have to burp. It's how Devin Prisilek found out. Um, they're getting rid of the view of my arm right now. The game wasn't built for her, so she'd have to work even harder. Warm up. <laughs> if you ask any like people who are born with limb differences, they'll definitely say that it does get hard trying to keep that that great mentality all the time is very difficult. You never expect to go out into the field and be like, oh, your best player is the girl with one arm. Like, you don't expect to hear that or see that, but she proves it. I just always thought I could do anything. Well, I had that mentality because of my mother. If you interview her, she'll tell you. I told her can't was never in her vocabulary. She can never say no. She can't do something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. You know it tickles. Uh uh. It's <laughs> Mom Michelle has been by Devin's side since day one. Why do you laugh? I don't it get it. So Sometimes to the embarrassment of her teenage daughter. I feel like it's a little excessive. It tickles so bad. When Devin was born with one arm, Michelle just saw a little girl with a world of possibilities ahead of her. She watched her learn to tie her shoes on her own. 
compete on a cheerleading squad. You're going to be a famous one-handed softball player. And just a few years ago, make a varsity softball team her first year playing. But I do love watching you grow and become the young adult that you're supposed to be. <laughs> I, you know? <laughs> Not in jail or anything like that. <laughs> Moms are supposed to worry about the what ifs, even when their daughters never give them a reason to. Hey, two down, plays at one, he's shooting two. It was not that I didn't think she could do it. We just needed to know that someone, you know, the coaches were willing to take her on and think outside the box. Wheels, wheels, wheels. Coach Paul saw Devin's potential and wanted to see it grow. I noticed she was behind everything. So every ball she was hitting on a, on a, a quicker pitcher was going the opposite direction. It could be like a full swing where I'm like, all my might and power, but then the ball just, <laughs> ball just drops. I stopped it, I never follow through. Devin had to choke up too high on the bat's handle. A good eye, a good eye. Her coach wondered, what if a company could make something different? Let's go. So Paul, Get her in. he made some calls. This one is with our new, our newest bat, the, the purple and black one. An ax bat answer. She needed barrel control. She needed to have a bat that was weighted correctly. Um, and those are all things that our team were, were able to design. The company Taylor makes bats for professional players, but their most extreme customization, the barrels are the same length, is for a high schooler. So it's like a normal bat, but the handle is shorter. You know, I offered to pay for it. I offered to do it. They didn't want nothing. They said just the gratitude of making something for Devin, that's, they're behind her 100%. Wheels, 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 go! I, I choke up thinking about that because even when Devin goes off to college next year, <laughs> moments like this make it easy for mom to imagine the best. That somebody's willing to put forth the effort to watch somebody succeed. I officially put a sticker on my water bottle that says softball mom. I finally caved. It's only natural for people to wonder what if. She can hear my every goal. Because some fears become reality. It's all right, Devin. Brush it off. But Devin makes the people around her wonder what if there's another way. There you go. Determination and ingenuity. It's a sign that we've been warned not to show you. Plus your feedback, next. It's a sign that the sign would like some privacy, please. So avert your eyes. It is a private sign. You're not allowed to read it. Our viewer Samantha was cycling near Gold Hill outside Boulder when she saw this. She did a double take and she knows the next rules. If you do that, you have to take a photo and send it to us so we can share it statewide. Even if the sign specifically tells you that's not allowed. Private sign, public sign, if you look twice, send it our way. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. Lynn Forrester in Littleton writes in tonight, if there are so many issues with discarded needles in Civic Center Park, why isn't a safe injection site not part of the plans? Honestly, Lynn, it's because Democrats in the state legislature, while they have the majority, they have not had the votes to give Denver the permission it would need to proceed with a plan like that. I've been watching your word of thanks donations roll in. And I'm happy to tell you within the last few minutes, you passed $4.7 million in giving since last year.